um, asking about the viability for uh, living shoreline. And I'm like, how is that going to work? Because we're so open to the northeast, the southeast, the due east. I mean, is it even feasible in that kind of location? Uh, so it's definitely that question. So Anne Arundel County, wide open area. How do you do living shoreline? And by the way, check in. Can everybody hear Chris when he's speaking? Everybody hear me? I'll get it closer to my mouth. Um, so as far as whether you can do living shorelines in a large fetch system, so the fetch is going to be uh, the fetch is the amount of energy that could potentially come to your shoreline from any direction. So if you're looking at a potential site, you would find your longest point to land. And you know, you're looking at the fetch right here it is pretty darn big because it goes way down there to the south. So um, in that situation, you're gonna have huge rocks and there's gonna be really, really big boulders and they're gonna weigh anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 pounds a piece. And they're just gonna be stacked in essentially a trapezoid with a cutoff wall towards the water. And it will withstand pretty much everything Mother Nature can throw at it. And a lot of that has to do with contact. The boulders has, have to be really well placed. And there's, rel there's two different, there's different types of that that you can do. And there's offshore breakwaters that aren't connected to the land. So if you're familiar with like Mayo Beach, uh, those have offshore breakwaters in Anne Arundel County. Um, Sorry, Beverly Triton. Beverly Triton has offshore breakwaters. The headland breakwaters are more like what is actually happening down here. I saw it on the map. Maybe we can walk down there in a little bit and take a look at it because right here, we're really just looking at a riprap revetment, uh, which could potentially work in that situation, but that's not a living shoreline. But if you get really, really big boulders out there and you go channel word, I mean, the the core has certain requirements of how far, limitations to how far you can go out, but you can backfill with a lot of sand behind it and you can create marsh habitat. It's just your boulders have to be really big, really well touching, really well good contact and uh, out there far enough that the energy is dissipated. And what, we'll, what they do now in all living shorelines is create vents in them. So if you had a headland breakwater that had an, a vent, an opening, um, one of the projects that we did was Fort Smallwood. Fort Smallwood's had a lot of work done to it in northern Anne Arundel County, and it was a headland breakwater system designed by Baylands in Anne Arundel County. And you create tombolos of like a sand spit. Uh, so you're almost creating like an island of the riprap out there. And then you plant that. It's hard to, hard to describe without a picture, but it's like a semicircle. If you look on Google Maps, you'll find it all over the Chesapeake Bay. There's a, a line of riprap out in the water, and then there's a semicircle of sand connecting it to the next one. And that's essentially a headland breakwater with a tombolo. And you could do that in that type of situation. With really high fetch, you could still make that work. Because we did it on the middle Patapsco at Fort Smallwood, and it's holding up great, really doing well. And there's a huge fetch up there. Uh, so again, my name is Chris Perry. Uh, my company is Born Environmental. We do ecological construction. We primarily do stormwater and stream restoration, but over the past three or four years, we've had the opportunity to do a lot of large scale living shorelines. Uh, so I'll talk just about a couple of them. I've already mentioned some of them, just trying to answer a question about the amount of energy and when you can use a living shoreline. Um, but in this situation right here, we're looking at a a riprap revetment, so not a living shoreline right here. You go from upland and you drop down immediately to the tidal zone. So what we're trying to recreate in a living shoreline is the littoral zone, the zone between mean low water and mean high water, and you're trying to create, use as much natural products as you can to recreate a functional marsh. The benefit to that is it's gonna, it's gonna survive even the biggest storm events even though it might not seem as strong as a seawall or a bulkhead or anything like that, all that energy that's coming at it is going to be dissipated partially by the sill that you create, but also a lot by the vegetation. So the vegetation is pretty key in everything that we do. So farther over here to my right, it goes into a living shoreline situation, but
but I don't think that they put vents in them from what I can see on Google Maps. Uh, so you're seeing a pretty closed off system. I can't really tell if it's Phragmites from here or Cynoceroides, I'm guessing it's Phrag, but that is a potential that will happen in living shoreline situations. Um, so really high energy structures like this should have really big boulders out there and they should also have vents though, and that will create kind of a tidal flushing. Uh, when you get into lower fetch situations, we just built a project on the Patuxent River near Magruder's Ferry Landing, and it was essentially a stone sill. A very typical uh, living shoreline. Lots of people have them installed, private landowners and whatnot, but the, the big driver for this project is credits. Uh, the credit game in the state of Maryland is, is pretty severe. If you're not familiar with the industry of restoration, both stream credits, uh, wetland credits, stormwater credits, it drives a lot of the money that's being spent on restoration. And so you're looking for water quality. So a lot of times wildlife gets overlooked, unfortunately, but it has a, they're mutually beneficial. So at the end of the day, it still works out. So the living shoreline that we built in the Patuxent River uh, was a stone sill, uh, much smaller you describe boulders. describe a stone sill, what that is, and also describe vents and what they, sure. or what they look like. So a, a stone sill is going to be like what you see out there. If you can't see it, feel free to move around and take a look at it. Maybe we'll walk there. But a stone sill is like a trapezoid. Think of the cross section of it is going to be a trapezoid, essentially. It's probably going to have a little footer kicking towards the water. But a cross sectional angle of it is a trapezoid, probably going to have a four foot wide top to it, meaning it's going to be flat for four feet on the top. And then it's going to have a two to one slope channel word. And on the back side, it might have a more gradual slope and it'll be backfilled with sand up to it. The elevation of that sand is what kind of varies. But that is what a sill is. It's a, it's a structure that you put channel word from where your erosion is happening and you try to break that wave energy before it gets to the erodible soils. So we're almost, everything that I've been talking about so far and where we are right now, we're in the coastal plain. So not very typical to see a lot of granite being imported, but that's what we do. We import a lot of granite to dissipate that energy, and we would love to use wood and more natural stuff in all those situations, uh, but it's pretty challenging when you have really high fetch situations. Um, the vents are gaps in that sill that you build out there to allow the water to come in and the fish to go out. So if you get a really high tide event, you don't have any vents, there's all sorts of critters that come inside and then they can't get through the barrier of all that stone. So that was kind of a early iteration that I think DNR and some of the others involved in shoreline restoration in the beginning of it realized pretty quickly, you got to have an opening. What size is that then? Um, it will depend on how- The question was, what size is the physical vent? So, I'm thinking it's going to vary. An engineer would have a better answer for you. They have a, a certain ratio of it, um, but I mean, it could be anywhere from four feet to 40 feet, depending on how big the, the structure is. So if you're on a system like this, you could probably, and you've got really big boulders, you probably have up to a 40 foot opening. If there was something much smaller on a smaller tributary, you'd only do, you know, three to four feet of a gap. So it, it, it varies a lot. It also varies on how much sand you want to keep inside of it. So some of the projects that we do require 7,000, 10,000 tons of sand to be imported. So obviously the cost of these projects goes way, way up and we're trying to incorporate wood, incorporate more natural materials that we can find on site to drive that cost down. Uh, but while I'm talking about it in general, the cost can be anywhere from $100 a linear foot to $1,500 a linear foot. I mean, the projects get very, very expensive and very, very quickly. Um, so that is, we've talked about headland breakwater. We've talked about a sill, just a run of the mill stone sill. Um, you can also do things that are called low profile sills, whether they're made out of wood or they're made out of rock. The idea is instead of having something that's above mean high water, I actually thought it was a lot here. Um, Maybe it is, and it's just extremely high, but that sill should always pretty much stay above mean high water. 
So you should be able to see the top of the stone pretty much at any time in mean high water. That helps for sea level rise, it helps for storm surges, and it's then you're not creating a navigational hazard. But there are other approaches where you can have a low profile sill that stays just below mean low water on typical tides, and you backfill the sand right to the top of that stone. Whereas on the majority of these living shorelines, the backfill of sand is going almost to the bottom of your stone structure. And then you kind of, you have that horseshoe that's created wherever your vents are. And it happens naturally, those, those horseshoes, even if you don't plan for it, it just happens. Uh, the, go ahead. Can you repeat the question? So the question is, where do we get the granite? Where do we get the sand? Uh, not from anywhere nearby, unfortunately. So, uh, and that's a gripe about my industry and I totally understand it. We import granite from Frederick or Baltimore County and it comes down into the coastal plain and we put it in the coastal plain. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but if you think about how else are you gonna stop erosion, that the main driver is water quality. So a lot of these are being driven by credit how much sediment and nutrients can you stop from going into the Chesapeake Bay? And there was a paper put out a few years ago that the, especially on river systems, the number one cause of nutrient, or excuse me, the number one cause of sediment pollution into the Chesapeake Bay is now lateral stream erosion. So it's not the invert of the stream going down, it's streams and rivers eroding sideways. And when you get into stream restoration is more my wheelhouse, but when you, when you get into stream restoration, you start talking about your bankful width, how soon is it gonna go into, how soon is the storm event gonna go into the floodplain? And you also talk about your width depth ratio. And as you start eroding the sides of the stream, the stream itself gets filled in and gets shallower. And that's extremely bad for the stream health because it's supposed to be a certain type of channel so then that also causes uh, pollution into the Chesapeake Bay. So that's the trade-off. We're trying to stop all that sediment from going into the Chesapeake Bay that's laden with nutrients, whether it's from good farming practices, bad farming practices, or just neighborhoods. A lot of it has to do with uh, everything that runs off of all, all of our urban areas that are really built up. So most of the boulders, some of it, we even price it coming from Virginia. Uh, surprisingly enough, some of it comes from Virginia. And the sand is typically the eastern shore. There are some places along the Patuxent River where we get sand. Uh, it's actually more expensive to get it from there than it is to ship it across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge as far as western shore projects. Uh, so it has a carbon footprint for sure. But um, the alternative is you just keep losing sediment you just keep losing land and that's a lot of the a lot of especially private landowners their number one complaint is not necessarily i want to build the best duck hunting habitat i you know i want to i want to be able to fish rock fish off of these cool structures you build off of here that's usually not the first complaint the first complaint is i'm about to lose my house or i'm about to lose my road and that's what they want to stop so by all means necessary they want to do that good morning uh Different items you're talking about. Will that help uh, stop the salt water intrusion coming in in shore? Yes. So the salt salt water intrusion, uh, as well as subsidence and uh, sea level rise, are all problems that you face on the shoreline. And when we build shorelines, they're almost always. I can't think of an instance where they're not. You're pushing mean high water out. So that means you're keeping that salt water that much farther away. And there are limitations to it. You can go on historical maps and you can see that potentially there was a marsh going out 200 feet here. Well, the core, MDE, probably mostly the core. Sorry if there's anybody from the core here. But the core will say probably you're not going to be allowed to reclaim all that marshland. They're not going to let you go back out that far. But there is a certain extent that you can go out and have no problems whatsoever reclaiming essentially your property. And that will help with all those problems. Yes, sir. Can 
Can you repeat the question? Uh, the question is, how do we kind of, let's see, what is the question? The question is, how do we uh, continue to have living shorelines? Because that is something that the state is pushing for. Uh, how do we make it so that we're not going to have uh, public use impacting it? Or how do we make this be more vegetated? As far as this being more vegetated, I think it's a pretty hard sell. Behind this rock is a filter fabric cloth whether it's woven, non-woven, there's some kind of fabric back there that's blocking the sediment from the actual rock. Eventually you might get some siltation in there. It's accreting in between the cracks and you might get something to grow, but it's pretty unlikely. And then this thing is, the energy that this thing is getting is head on really hard. And so it's not like in a, in a sill where it hits that rock and then it goes over it and then it gently comes in. It's pretty neat watching Spartina in a coastal marsh when a wave hits it and you just watch that energy dissipate. Um, but as far as keeping the public kind of, not necessarily keeping them out of it, but making it so that they're compatible, um, we use fencing. We use fencing, honestly, to keep resident geese out, which is something I've got to get to before I run out of time here. But um, there's definitely a way, Fort Smallwood is a great example. Anne Arundel County Park said, we want to be able to still have a beach we want to be able to still have tons of public access. People love this beach. Like, okay, well, you got to meet so many marsh credits. Like we've got to, we have to have so many square feet of Spartina alterniflora, Spartina patens. That's the low marsh and the high marsh plants in a brackish system. Uh, so what we did was we chose one of the tombolos, one of the spits of sand that went out to the, the headland breakwater that we built was vegetated all the way to it. And then the rest of them were just vegetated kind of mostly with Spartina patens on the high marsh side, and you left the rest of it for beach. That doesn't mean eventually Spartina alterniflora isn't gonna migrate there and figure it out, um, which it will. Well, I think we had another couple of questions. I thought, was Dan first or were you first? So just real quick before another Go question, I, I mentioned resident geese. If I don't talk about this, I'll be very mad at myself. Resident geese are a huge problem and everybody really needs to be aware of how bad they are. I go to lots of stormwater communities where we spend thousands of dollars, excuse me, lots of communities that have stormwater ponds being retrofit and we spend thousands of dollars on the landscaping and we have to put up goose exclosure fence and sometimes it's not even enough because they won't even consider culling the flock of geese that's on the pond. They are doing a number on the Chesapeake Bay and they do a number on wild rice in the early season when they're growing. They nip the top of it and that plant is not going to grow. So by all means, kill resident geese. <laughs> and those are distinct from migratory geese. And so that's, that's different we, season. Yeah, we can talk about as well. Mark. Hey, uh, uh, Chris, we, we, because you're, you do installation work for everyone here, if they should see a segment of eroded shoreline, what's the mean typical cost per linear foot? to do your rock work, to, to, to do the, the ecological restoration of a living shoreline? Is it 300 a linear foot, 500? I would say it's in, that, it's in that ballpark for a private landowner. It's probably somewhere around there. Um, when, and that kind of the same for stream restoration as well. When we get into the $1,000 projects, that's usually state funded public job or county jobs that are either generating a lot of credits or they're just protecting some incredibly valuable resource. Um, and then a lot of the stuff that I am hopeful to get into more in the future is using really native material, low impact stuff that a private landowner will want to do because a lot of our projects, like I say, are credit driven, but private landowners don't care about credit. They also don't, might not have a six foot tall bank that's eroding at so many feet horizontally per year. And that's what drives the credits. And that's why someone would pay for that. That's why the county would pay for it. So you use a private landowner, you say, okay, well, I just have a whole bunch of tidal marsh and I'm losing like five feet every year. Like, what do I do? They're like, okay, well, we don't want to bring a whole bunch of granite boulders out there because A, it's kind of ridiculous. And two, nobody's paying for that. So you got to pay for it. So in low impact scenarios, we're really trying to move coir logs disintegrate coir logs are we use coconut husk for almost all of our stabilization and there are coir logs that are just tightly bound coconut husks and they come in like a 12 inch to it two foot 
roll and you can use them for shoreline protection, but they disintegrate if you don't keep them wet for a really long time. So you got to use wood and other kind of uh, oyster reefs are another thing that's becoming more and more popular. People are not just throwing bags or dumping shells out there. They're actually coming up with really innovative techniques that are either some kind of cement or some kind of hardened structure. And then they put that spat on it and it just promotes growth that much faster. All right, I think we have time for one more question and we are just scratching the surface. I think we could go on for easily an hour on this, um, but don't forget, we're going to be here for a while. We got lunch, so make sure we'll, we'll take one more question. We're going to move to the waterfowl piece, um, but when, I don't know who will raise their hand first, but you, Larissa, you're right beside me. Go ahead. All righty. Hey, this isn't a technical question, so I apologize if you don't know the answer, but maybe it's an open-ended question for anyone here who knows what I'm going to talk to you about later. It's my understanding that the shoreline used to be a cost share practice, and that's no longer the case today. But I'm seeing in states like Virginia, it's an agricultural cost share practice, and that makes it a lot more affordable and therefore a lot more accessible to landowners. And I'm wondering why or why not it would or would not work again here in Maryland. Yeah, let's, let's find all those state representatives here and give them a hard time. But I, <laughs> I don't, I don't know the answer to that, and I, I don't think we should give the state people a hard time. I think right now where it stands, I've been at private landowners' marshes with DNR and said, hey, you know, what do we do? This is a huge, very valuable marsh. I mean, we should get state highway involved. It's protecting Route 50. You know, like really important things like that. And you're like, all right, where's the money? And so, well, you're a private landowner that owns this property, and you're protecting it basically for yourself or so that you can go duck hunting. Obviously, there's a lot of other benefits to it, but until you find that stakeholder that's willing to come forward with the money, the most that DNR is going to do, because you're not really going to apply or you're not going to qualify for most of the grants. And if I'm speaking out of turn, if anybody from DNR is here and has a better uh, grip on it, please let me know. Um, but the, the, the number one thing that they will absolutely do is do a loan. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's coming out of state revolving fund. I don't really don't know where that money comes from, but that's their number one source of revenue for a private landowner. What I suggest to lots of people, especially people that are promoting public access to their property or they're a foundation, a nonprofit. If they're a private landowner, I say, make it a nonprofit. I don't care what you do, but you open yourself up to all sorts of grant opportunities. If you're a homeowners association, they can apply for grants where a private landowner couldn't. You, just because you're a community of people, you, you get deference on a lot of grants. All right. So uh, Luke's in you, charge. Yeah. Let me a quick question. And after this, we'll wrap things up. And we're going to walk just to give everybody a telegraph. Uh, we're going to head over to a waterfowl impoundment structure. And we're going to walk along uh, a, a path up over here. Uh, so I think we're all good to walk. If you if you need to drive, you can. Or if you have some folks who can't get too far, it's going to be just a couple hundred yards over that way. Um, so that's just a get you oriented, but I think we can walk there. Go ahead, Levin. So you said that they'll loan me the money to do some sort of work like that. What would the interest rate on a loan like that be? Or is it very, very low interest or? Would it I think, I think it's low. I think it's fixed, but I don't know those numbers exactly. I've never been through that process. If I get to that point, I'm probably diverting and saying, okay, well, let's do a mitigation bank or let's try to get a full delivery through state highway, some other means of somebody paying for it. So a lot of terms happening here, mitigation banks, other things like that. So, okay, you, you got me, go ahead, what do you got? No, I actually wanted to um, let you know that the, um, the Chesapeake Coastal Service of DNR, they have a grants gateway webpage. And one of the items on that grants gateway is about the low interest for erosion loan. Cool. All right. So lots more to cover. Uh, feel free to talk to speakers and to each other. Sounds like Leanne here uh, knows some things about that stuff. So if you're, if you're interested in more of that, find her.